welcome to Jump School. I'm your host, Hassan Ali, aka The Style Jumper. On this podcast, we'll be discussing how to jumpstart your mindset by dressing well, boost your style, confidence, and etiquette. I'll also be discussing things like mental and physical health, the power of creativity to rejuvenate your soul. The following is an excerpt from Instagram Live. Let's go. What I want to do, Omar, is is really I give everyone an opportunity to get to know who you are, okay. talk about your brand, and um, give a little background story on you. Um, I, I'm finding that a lot of guys who really enjoy the interviews I'm having is people that they don't know and brands they don't know of, but mm-hmm. particularly brothers, you know, men and women of color has been really interesting um, because I think it's really important to have to create a platform and to talk about business and style, particularly in style, because obviously you're a very stylish guy and that's something we both have in common. And then also that is not seen on a common basis. So I want to start with, you know, share your origin story, where are you from, um, and where'd you grow up, and, and tell me a little bit about yourself, let everybody know. Uh, yes, sir. So although I am now a hardcore uh, AT Elliot, I grew up in Connecticut, right? So a, a bit uh, a bit away uh, away from the Northeast. Um, I mean, yeah, that's where I spent the majority of childhood, went to middle school, high school, and then made my way from Connecticut, Hamden, Connecticut, not too far from New Haven in New York, uh, made my way to the illustrious uh, University of North Carolina, A&T State University, number one HBCU in the nation. Uh, so as you cried, so, yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, man, so I, you know, I was down there, um, you know, had a fantastic experience, you know, tried to delve into a little bit of everything, you know, played some football, started out studying chemical engineering, um, switched to, to business, uh, you know, was part of the Spanish Honor Society uh, business uh, group, did some volunteering services, and uh, nonetheless, and then above all, one of the, uh, the great experiences, had opportunity to pledge and join uh, Cap Office Soft Attorney Incorporated. So, yo, to all, all the noobs out there. Um, and, and then another very cool aspect of my school and my collegiate experience was I was able to study abroad. Um, and I'll tell you what, man, um, you know, as a gentleman like yourself who is very worldly, understands and appreciates travel, having that experience of studying in another country, another culture, you know, Everything that comes along with that was extremely beneficial, amazing, something that, you know, I, I would do again in a heartbeat. So, okay, um, where did you go? Monterey, Mexico. Huh. So, yeah, I studied abroad there for uh, like a semester and wish I could have been there for a whole year. Uh, but anyway, so I, I want to avoid too much of that. But I mean, I, and I say that because like I thought, I think that was a stage in which I really started to appreciate style. Um Seeing all of the the cultures, because this was a, it's a it was a very well known uh, uh, exchange program yeah. and a school for international studies, which was uh, it's called a TESM um, or Tech de Monterey, and that's where I got a you know strong understanding of different styles from these different cultures, right? So you know, fast forward, finished up my collegiate career and started working in Atlanta for a printing company. Now. I, I thought my career was going to consist of, you know, moving up the ladder to be, you know, a high-ranking, you know, powerful uh, corporate executive. But you know how things go, man. It just doesn't work out that way. Yeah. Um, and you know, I was kind of, you know, biding my time and, and moving up, and went back to school to get my MBA in strategic management and marketing, and just wasn't working out. So, you know, after finishing my business school program, I had some free time and ended up coming across a problem, which was. I can't keep my pocket square from staying up in my breast pocket, right? You know, so I was, I was out meeting with new clients, um, you know, continuing to, you know, rock the blazer or the, or the suits and always had the pocket square fall down, fall down, fall down. So this is back in like 2014. I'm like, man, it has to be a better way. So I ended up inventing a pocket square holder, right? Mm-hmm. And this was, you know, my... You know, my tone of water, my foray into men's fashion on the the retail side of things, you know, and uh, and actually it was my wife that said, you know, hey, you should you should move forward and sell it. I was just, you know, inventing it for myself. Um, so I, I moved forward trying to get it patented and went through the whole process. And lo and behold, man, I was like a few steps from actually getting it patented and. We found out that there were some conflicts and complications. That's like a whole nother story. Oh, but man. needless to say, um, 
I was not able to get patented, and that kind of hurt my heart because, you know, I was selling online, like eBay, Amazon, Etsy, some local boutiques, or rocking and rolling, and once I was able, if I was able to obtain the patent, then boom, I can go ahead and, and start mass distributing, I can get, you know, some funding, and just really blow it up. It didn't happen that way. So did you have to do a cease and dismiss afterwards, or are you just kind of... So, so, so yes and no. So, if I were to continue with that same design, if the other brand would have gotten the patent, then they can come back and sue me for back revenue. I was like, well, let me not, let me not try that. I changed the design, man, and sales just plummeted. I was like, okay, you know, I, I want to keep moving forward, kind of on this, you know, side hustle entrepreneurial step. Let me see what can happen. And I had a master tailor overseas that was making custom pieces for me already. And it's a hard did. I reached out to him. I was like, hey. You know, I have a brand at the time it was OSK Styles. You know, I understand the marketplace. I'm in Atlanta. Uh, I understand construction, quality fabrics. Can you make custom pieces for me and for my clients? He said, yeah, not a problem. I was like, oh, okay, well, let's do that then, you know? So, okay. <laughs> okay. Let's do yeah, so, so in 2016... Uh, that's when I started going into the realm of custom, right? So I started out with custom suiting, right, tuxedos, shirts, and from there I kept building up, building up, building up so that, you know, I was able to provide an offering that included jeans, sweaters, shoes, bags, the, the whole nine. Um, and I ended up going full-time because I got laid off in 2017. So fortunately, I built up the brand or the, uh, the offering enough to wear you know, it's it's going 100. percent You know, blood, sweat, and tears every day, but uh, but it's worth it. You know. Well, you know, it, it's really interesting, man, and that's a great story. There's there's so much I was thinking about. Was one is when you went to Mexico, and because for me, it wasn't until I went, I joined the Navy, where I saw this, you know, variety of of black culture. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I grew up in South Carolina, so you go in boot camp or you go on a ship, and I went to the West Coast, and you have brothers from all over the world i mean all over the country and the styles are completely different you know oh yeah you know what i mean the way you're the way you move your slang all that's different so it was such an eye-opening experience for me here in the states and just with brothers you know it, it just yeah. really really blew me away and so i was i was thinking you know who were some of your influences because okay you, you decided to create this this pocket square um, device, if you will, mm -hmm. product. Yep. Who were some of your, your, your influences growing up? So my dad, uh, above all, right, when it comes to business, style, you name it, um, he has always been somebody that I looked up to and tried to emulate in terms of style. And what's interesting, right, is, you know, when you're younger, you look at anybody older as like, ah, they're not cool, they don't know what they're doing. Bro, my dad was like always light years ahead of anybody when it came to style. And he would like set my brothers and I up with, with garments from all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I would go to school and cast like, man, what's that? And, you know, I kind of hesitate because they're, they're coming at me. I'm like, well, is this, this? And they're like, oh, snap. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so my dad, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, so, so my dad has probably been, you know, the most influential factor, again, in terms of business and in style, um, and he's somebody that, again, I was emulated and just pulled, you know, just kind of small, you know, tidbits from, you know, and either pairing certain things and trying something new and, and going with different materials, um, just because he's always been, you know, unafraid and unabashed to, to try something new. Um, and granted, I pull influences from all over, but he's been, you know, the main source. Well, I can definitely tell that you you definitely uh, got the influence from Dad because the way you put <laughs> stuff together, Omar, is so fly, and, and it's and it's really awesome to see um, you kind of come into your own. And I remember us having a conversation even about the transition mm -hmm. from one brand name to the new bespoke tour. Yeah, and I was like you know, I was really curious, like why would you do that? So. I'm skipping around a little bit because I'm breaking the, the interviews based on your personal life, professional, and then mindset. So uh, sure, I'm sure. skip that because I'm really, really curious what that was for you as far as, you know, how do I make that switch in the brand mm -hmm. midstream? Yeah. And so, so here's the interesting, right? The interesting thing. I was trying to just adjust a little bit. That's fine. So initially... I had the first brand, OSK Styles, which is literally just my initial, right? Omar, Celine, Kinnebrew, and the Styles at the end. Because I was, you know, kind of venturing into this realm of, of 
retail and, and men's fashions on accessories. And I just, I needed an umbrella to house these pieces. So there wasn't, you know, too, too, too much thought put into that initially in terms of like color, styling, set. I just needed something to get the LLC and, and, and move forward. But moving forward, if I wanted, you know, my brand to be a true luxury brand, if I needed, you know, folks to see whether it be the font, the colors, you name it, the logo, they understand, you know, luxury, style, you know, bespoke pieces, then I had to make that that proper transition. And then I had to do it sooner, you know, rather than later because we started getting traction, traction in terms of clientele, exposure, et cetera. And, you know, speaking about it, and, you know, I tell folks, you know, when you see bespoke chair, it's very easy to kind of take the word bespoke in couture and yeah hey we have a bespoke chair but that's actually not the the kind of the background for the nomenclature or the moniker it's trademarked as the future of bespoke mm -hmm. and the reason for that is because you know uh, you know I'm a, a younger black man coming into this realm of custom tailoring and, and garments and footwear um, and with a with a mindset that is not only very customer centric but also very focused on the approach, you know, being able to streamline and vet out like the very best resources so that, you know, the quality is, you know, above, above the rest. The lead times are, you know, crush other, you know, brands, but clients can come to us and say, yo, I saw this and I want that. Not a problem. Let's do it. You know? And, and that with that, you're not know, continue to vet out the right master tailors, cobblers, artisans, production facilities, you name it. So that my clients know they can come to me for anything custom crafted from shoulder to toe, business wear, formal wear, casual wear. So Omar, that's great. Tell me like if, if I'm your new client, mm -hmm. give, me, give us a walkthrough of what that experience would be because I think, you know, there's a ton of custom clothiers out there. And, you know, yeah. I, you your goal is one of the goals is to separate yourself and why your brand is a luxury mm -hmm. brand and even just to even use that word luxury that completely takes away a, a, a swath of, of yeah. designers and, and no disrespect to any other out there mm -hmm. but tell, tell me a little bit about how that works you know what i mean you know and, and break that down mm -hmm. for us and and i'm glad you mentioned that because not only is there a distinct differentiation you know when you throw the the word luxury, but even in the realm of crafting pieces, you have ready to wear, right? Which is, you know, crafting pieces right off the rack. You have made to measure, which is uh, preset patterns, you know, pull fabric, cut to that pattern, make alterations. You have custom, which is maybe a new pattern, um, you know, craft pieces, you know, from pulling the fabric, uh, a hand cut or a machine cut pattern, um, machine, machine stitch, maybe finished with some hand stitching. And then you have a scroll. Mm -hmm. Right, and in the, in the true sense of, of bespoke, and that's what we were elevating to, is, you know, I, I work with you, on I capture all your measurements, you know, we pick out the, the fabric, you know, I take anywhere from, you know, 18 to 25 measurements, depending on what we're doing, you know, body photos, you know, map out your, your structure, and then I have a conversation with my tailor and pattern maker. Then we craft the pattern for you, again, it's, it's a personal, it's your pattern, right, specific to your body. Um, from there, we're going to create a muslin or basic fitting. That's going to be your trial fitting because we don't just want to use a standard set of measurements. We don't want to use just, you know, a standard trial and two. We don't want to kind of guess at this thing. So before we even cut your fabric, we're taking, you know, that muslin or basic fitting, put it on, and from there we we'll see how the drape, how the fit, every single detail is taken into consideration. And then once we've confirmed you like, the fit and feel, then I talk to my tail, we move forward with cutting the fabric. So after the fabric is then cut, now it's all hand stitch, right? I mean, major seams, small seams, finishings, you know, collar, buttonhole, you name it, it's all hand stitch, right? And so that is a way to separate from, you know, again, nothing wrong with a brand that's going ready to wear, made to measure, measure custom, you name it, but I couldn't just speak and talk about, hey, this is what I want to do. This is what the brand should be. No, I needed to set, you know, ourselves up to where this is what Bespoke is offering, right? And so although it may, uh, it, it may garner a, a high price point, but that's okay because our clients are receiving, you know, and they are valuing and appreciating what we're crafting for them, right? So we're using you know, the very best fabrics from Italy or England and just creating a, a masterful piece, 
Yeah, man, I'll tell you, you know, every time I see I'm like, gosh, I wish I could squeeze in one of those fits on Mark Gatto. Man, let me do a PB Herman, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't mind doing a Pee Wee. <laughs> um, but, but it's really cool, man. Um, one of the things that you've been focusing on that I've noticed and you and I have talked about is um, tuxedos. Right mm. in weddings and how important. Obviously, that's the should be the most important day of our lives, and one yeah. that we don't want to remember. And it's really interesting. And I, what I appreciate about what you're doing is usually it's always been the woman in her gown that's held on to, and it's the most beautiful piece in the wedding, and everyone looks for that as well as in the future. <laughs> right? You know, she can either pass it down to her daughter. Or just this piece that maybe, you know, five years down the road, 50th anniversary, 10th anniversary, putting yeah. on that wedding gown. But to have a bespoke tuxedo is completely different in a new thought process for men. Can you give me some concept and give us some ideas of, like, when did you make that distinction that this is something that you wanted to go into? And then mm -hmm. we'll talk a little bit about the impact of that because right now is obviously um wedding season and we have COVID mm -hmm. going on so so could you expound on that so it, honestly the the offering right just kind of you know the holistically the offering of providing cups and pieces for the, the wedding day came naturally just within the the realm of how we operate as a business right if we're creating awesome pieces you know for men or women and like hey can you make this tux like oh yeah of course um, but what we started understanding is not only just the extreme importance of that day um but also crafting something that is just you know extremely unique fits beautifully and really it's really honed in based on the location for the wedding whether it's in Georgia, on the West Coast, a destination wedding in Jamaica, right on the sand, uh, the temperature, you know, wearability. If it's something that they want to be like absolutely a one-time piece and, hey, we'll, we'll put it in a shadow box later or I want to wear it for the big day. I want to wear it, you know, in three months, you know, you name it. Um, it's all about really understanding how that client wants to wear their piece, right? And it's not just men, you know. And we're fortunate that we have a lot of women come and say, okay, look, Omar, I saw this tuxedo, right? I'm marrying my queen. I want a a, a men's style tuxedo, but I want a fe I want a female cut. We're like, boom, got you. Let's let's make it happen, right? Because again, at the end of the day, our goal is to absolutely hands down ensure that our clients walk away feeling, you know, phenomenally, you know, beautiful and amazing and powerful in the custom pieces that we make for them. So, you know, the tuxedo element, like I said, just kind of came about naturally in which the direction that we go with the business, but you know, our goal was to create a, a phenomenal product and piece that, yeah, again, that they could not find anywhere else, that they could not compare with purchasing it somewhere else. Sure. That, that's beautiful, man. And, and just thinking about when you mentioned those queens out there who are getting married, you know, and they want a tuxedo as well, that's, that's an awesome opportunity and option because, you know, that mm -hmm. wasn't an option technically in years past and not specific to the body type. So, yeah. you know, I'm glad to hear that you're doing that and you're focused on it. Um, but you're you're doing some things that are a little different now when it comes to, um, you know, life with and after COVID. So there's a, a virtual <laughs> approach that you're doing and some consultations and fittings. Kind of talk about yeah. that because I think that's something that's that's new as well. Mm. I mean, yeah, man. I mean, you, you kind of touched upon it. Like, you know, in order to continue moving forward to survive, you have to make adjustments to the business, right? But not even for COVID, um, as the brand, you know, was building up, I had to make adjustments to account for clients that were either across the country or overseas, you know? So it's set up to where we can capture measurements from folks no matter where they are, you know, whether it's you know, video measurement sessions, whether it's them sending us pieces to pull finish measurements, measurements and with certain elements in their body structure, how like the fit, photos, you name it, you know, we're able to pull pieces and craft you know, just from there. Or, hey, you know, we'll, we'll get together now folks are getting more comfortable. We'll get together, you know, masks, gloves, you name it, and, and you know, not have things to there. But we have the ability to view fabrics online. Our, our clients have the ability to view fabrics online. We can send them design guides. You know, of course, there's nothing as simple and easy is jumping on the phone and talking through ideas. Um, and the good thing is that, 
you know, I'm able to understand what my client visions are, and then I can relay that to pattern maker, or master tailor, you know, you name it, to bring it to life. Got it. That, that's that's excellent. Um, so you spoke a little bit earlier about you know you have other products that you that you procure for people. So there's sh- shoes, you know, bespoke shoes. There's bags. Talk mm-hmm. about that because you know that's something that you know most people we say in air quotes get off the rack. They walk into the store, they try to pair shoes, and they're mm-hmm. good. Or they go online and they order a pair of shoes. They know their favorite brands, but what is that that dynamic when it comes to leather goods and shoes mm-hmm. and, and creating a new perspective on why someone would want to go that route as far as of purchasing that type of item. Mm-hmm. And so it's again it's another level of you know truly stepping up your game and having that that luxury lifestyle that that lifestyle of hey I can appreciate things that are crafted for me. I want to invest in having these pieces made for me. Um, and so it's something that's continuing to build up, right? You know, our our main, uh, you know, it's our bread and butter, you know, it's custom suits and tuxedos. But our clients are, are starting to come to us more and more and, and appreciating the footwear that we're making because not only do they understand, you know, just the level of customization that is allowed within this realm um, in terms of retail, but when we start diving into just the craftsmanship and the quality, again, it's some you know, like all the all of this is like all education based, right? And sometimes folks that are putting a lot of money into whatever, whether it's you know buying a bespoke suit, buying a luxury vehicle, purchasing a home, the more you know, the more powerful of a consumer you are, and the more you appreciate what you're putting your money into, right? And so a huge part of it is helping them understand the the level of quality in the leather, the construction of a Goodyear well, what that means for the longevity of a shoe, the steel shank and tie for support, you know, various sole styles for wearability, style, comfort, um, you know, you name it, you know, it, it's all it's all about understanding, you know, the value each individual can you know, really receive from what we're crafting for them. And, you know, after that, it's, it's not a problem with them saying, hey, I love it, let's do it. Here's my money, make me happy. And I'll come back, or I'm going to uh, refer some more folks to you. So, Omar, is the design process specifically with shoes, is that something that is on the site and I can go in and play around, you know, kind of like do some mock, mocks and models of different styles? How does that usually work? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting that you, you bring it up because to answer your question, yes, you know, a client can go on the side and play around with that through the design portal. However, I've begun shifting away from – you know, directing folks to either a, a portal where they can, you know, put pieces together for their suit or go and design their own shoes. And the reason for that is if you're not 100% familiar with the system, if you don't have a powerful, you know, operating device with not a lot of RAM, if your internet connection is slow, then you're going to have a bad experience navigating that site. And then what's going to happen? Now you have a bad taste in your mouth and you have a poor perception of the spoken chair and what we're offering, right? And the only way I know that is from feedback from folks running into those very problems. So instead of me trying to, you know, tell them, we're going to try it again, try it again, et cetera, I'll say, hey, you just, just, just direct everything to me, right? We'll talk about what you want because there also may be something available on that 3D design portal that you may miss or you may not understand the, the functionality capability. And so, hey, we'll walk through, I'll let you know everything that's in there. And if you want to, feel free to, to play around and navigate, but at least we have a connection, we have that talk so that, you know, there's no questions that are missed. There's no, there's, there are no assumptions that are made, you know, without having like a proper rebuttal. You know, I want to ensure that it's a, it's a personal, hands-on experience, you know, when a client comes to us or has an idea uh, for us. But if they want to like, absolutely design a bag or shoes or belt online, um, and I, I'm always here to help. Uh, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, the more technology that we have, the more we start playing, right? <laughs> <laughs> You can get confused or just like you're saying, you know, with our own computers, right? We start you yeah. know, playing around with something online and the computers start crashing. You're like, man, I need to get some more RAM. Or I need to get a new computer. And a lot of times not knowing that in that experience, you're you're losing the momentum of that excitement of purchasing because your computer or your phone or whatever the case may be is bogging you down. And, you know, you might lose opportunities because they're like, you know what, screw this. I'm just going to go, you know, check out whatever, you know, Norsham Rack, whatever the case may be, you know what I mean? And just like, it's a wrap. Yeah. So that, that's yeah. really interesting. I, I'm glad you, you pointed that out. 
Another thing that I was thinking when it comes to um, bespoke um, is two two part. One is mm -hmm. what I've observed. You know, body types are, are you know all over the board. And one of the things that I I recognize, and even just noticing your body, you have really sloped shoulders, right? And so yes, sir. Tell you know there's there's a demographic out there who deals with that, and. What are some things that you found to, to be really helpful in building, you know, kind of like designing a, a, a custom piece that complements your shape and not take away from, you know, those unique challenges? Because, you know, I would assume that that can be a challenging, a challenge because a lot of students, especially off the rack, is just, you know, straight across or slightly sloped. So, you know, tell us about that. Absolutely. And, and I love the fact just that, again, you know, you are a brother in the know, because not a lot of people even understand, you know, what that means or what it entails as it relates to, uh, you know, crafting a piece for somebody. Uh, so, first and foremost, right, nobody's body is perfect. And so when you pull something off the rack, you are pulling a mass produced garment that is cut for everybody. If it's cut for everybody, it's, it's not cut for anybody, you know. And so you're just using one set pattern. But you know, to to your mention of sloping shoulders, it could be somebody that either their shoulders are you know, kind of down and sloping forward, or they work out a lot and they build up their, their trapezius muscles, right? So it's kind of bulky on, on there. I mean, you have all these different nuances and intricacies of each and every body, and it comes down, it's on to the path, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's something that not only, you know, does your, your clothier have to understand, but then the pattern maker, you know, your tailor's cutting it because they need to understand at what point should we be breaking, right, in terms of breaking um, the jacket from on the shoulder line, um, how should we be placing the sleeve head, right, should it be a certain sleeve pitch because, you know, you have sloping shoulders, but then my shoulders fall forward, so if there's not the, if there is not the appropriate sleeve pitch, then I'm going to get a lot of space on the back side of my shoulder, right? And then if you don't have a proper break on the pattern and then we craft in the garment, then you get that neck roll, right? Or you get, um, or you can get, you know, puckering up top here, or you can get like a very tight, you know, front part. Like just so many different issues. If there's not enough space to allow for the sloping shoulders, to allow for the way the arms fall forward or the shoulder falls forward, the way that the arms are positioned, how large, you know, the chest may be, then the relationship with a drop from the, the chest to the... Uh, the stomach, you know, where the, the first button stance may be, because that can help you either bring in the chest area or it may pucker out, depending on how high or low it may be. You know, these are all things that, now granted, anybody else, you know, their eyes may gloss over, but, you know, you can appreciate it. And um, when I'm talking I'm to clients, and I, I'm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, you know, you know, I can talk about it for days, you know, uh, without, without trying to, you know, bore your audience here. Um, but you know, when, I, when I walk through those details of the client and help them understand what I'm looking at, what I'm looking at to have a conversation with my tailor about and what they can expect, then they're blown away and also happy because they say, that's why this suit doesn't fit like that. Yeah, that's why this happens exactly. when I wear this jacket. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, you know, so you just, you just, knowledge again, as always, is power. And whether somebody's working with my brand or going somewhere else, I'll talk to anybody about it because I still want them to know what they're doing, what they're looking for, you know. I'm happy to sit down and have like an hour-long conversation about fabric composition with anybody just so they can understand what it means to have a quality garment, you know, wherever they may purchase it, you know. It's, it's, it's awesome because, you know, again, people don't really truly understand the value of bespoke mm -hmm. and the professionalism, the knowledge, and all those different nuances that's so important and why it – the cost of that garment is so much different than yeah. something that's off the rack and to have that expertise and then the care factor because you can just put anything together and not care what the end result is going to be so all yeah. of this is super important and is you know i wanted to make sure that the listeners get a real good understanding of yeah. the value of having you know your products your your garments made to measure like like made measure to your body custom mm -hmm. bespoke completely because if you have that opportunity because we spend our money on a bunch of things to your point earlier yeah, yeah. we spend a lot of and if we just take those dollars that we've been going you know out to dinner for a, for a month you know what i mean yeah or, or you know buying you know a bunch of sneakers or whatever the case may be and you say okay i'm going to invest this amount of money mm -hmm. in this beautiful piece that is made to my body 
I mean, cause 90, I would say gather say 99% of people have never had anything custom made for them. You know, exactly. Or, or yeah. Or, or, or even, yeah. And or even understand the process like you're saying. Yeah. And you know, you mentioned just the, the quality and uh, having a uh, understanding of the craft or, or putting in the right work in order to, to create these amazing pieces. But it's something that I always love mentioning as well. Right. And, Perception plays like a major part in most of the things that we spend money on, right? I mean, heck, that's a whole realm of, of marketing. Yeah. And the reason why I, I say that is because when I tell folks where we craft garments, right, whether it's in Asia or Europe, now I wait to see if they have a follow-up question, if they have a preconceived notion, and they say, well, I don't know about X, Y, Z. And I always laugh, right, because you can have the absolute worst master tailor in Italy and the best master tailor in Sri Lanka, right? It's yeah. all about that person's individual skill. Um, and so, and that's why, that's why I, said, I never have a problem talking about, uh, you know, construct, fabric construction or composition, construction of a garment, you name it, um, you know, finishing because if the skill is there, the skill is there, the skill is there. If the knowledge is there, the knowledge is there. Now, you get materials from all over the world. Don't, don't, you, know, you don't have to worry about that because you can source materials from all over. If you have the right team of individuals, the right you know, craftsmen and women, the right artisans, you, know, you, can, you can get away with anything. You know? Spectacular. Spectacular. So well, I want to shift to uh, mindset a little bit. And this actually goes to branding. Your photos are always on point, man. Who's taking your photos? There's one thing I saw this video you did, bro. Where you was getting out that water in the suit. I was like, yes. <laughs> hey, look. Oh my God. Hey, look. Up in here. You're doing some, you know, Houdini. I'm like, Dude. what's going on? Tell, tell us about that. Dude, the funny thing is, that, like, that could not have been more impromptu and. You know, all all credit and shout out goes to my younger brother. Uh, his name is Vandrick, and on IG it's VK3 underline thing photography, whatever that mark is. Uh, VK3, yeah, photography. Um, I actually like s somewhat forced this man to to work with me because he, he you know, it's a, it's a it's a side passion of his. You know, he has a corporate job, an amazing organization, but he started just as a hobby taking landscape photography. Or taking landscape photos, and as I saw, like you know, his work develop more and more. I was like, "Van, bro, dude, you gotta, you gotta shoot for me, right?" And so we would do some shots here and there. He started upgrading his equipment, and the uh, the pool shot. We were on vacation as a family, and he told me he was gonna have his equipment. I was like, "Oh, bro, I I have a suit wherever I go. Not a problem for on the island, right?" Let's go. And so. Yeah, and I already had an idea. I just wanted him to like take his GoPro, capture some photos, like being in the water here and there, and then I stopped. I said, "Okay." I have an idea. If this works, it's going to look really cool. Or it's going to look super, super, super lame, but, you know, it doesn't hurt to try. And so all I did was ask him to uh, to get rolling. My wife helped as well, and I just walked backwards into the pool, and then he did all the editing and reversed it to where I'm coming out of the water. Oh. And so, yeah, man, yeah. Keep going, and, keep going, folks. Yeah, yeah. And, hey, I have no problem telling people, how, hey, as long as it looks cool, you know. Um, and then it was also a testament to the garments. I, you know, I was in the pool. I was in the ocean. Um, yeah, I took off the pieces, washed them in cold water, hung dry, steamed, and I like, wore it two years later. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, so so Van does all my photography. He's doing my, my videography now, and um, it's awesome because I get to work with my brother yeah. and you know so support him building up his craft. Um, and he has like a, he has a strong eye, and it's just he's getting better and better and better. So um, I'm happy to see him doing his thing and. Yeah, selfishly, I get to work with him, and I'm like, all right, I got an idea, let's go shoot. He's like, all right, let's do it. You know? <laughs> and so he's in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I, man, I'm, I'm super fortunate. I have a ton of family down in Atlanta. We all, some way, somehow, like migrate down here, whether it's like jobs, you know, other family, you yeah. name it. And uh, yeah, so we're all, we're all surrounded. That, that's awesome. Um, you know, one of the things that's really important, and we heard it a little earlier. You know, being married, you're a father, you're married, and that ebbs mm -hmm. and flow of business and family life. You know, mm -hmm. what what have you done to sustain that beauty in your relationship with your wife? Because it's really important, right? You know, we, mm -hmm. we can get hyper-focused on the business, and yeah. then we find the people that we emulate a lot of times. They've married three times, you know. 10 kids from, from 12 women, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, 
it's, it's, it's really important, especially for, yes. for those of us who want to be an entrepreneur, who, who are, you know, maybe, you know, switching between transitioning careers or you have this side hustle that you're working on and you're working in corporate America. What are some, <laughs> you know, some, some, t- some tips that you can provide? Um, and I wish, I wish, wish mama could come on and give her, give the truth. I know you will get the truth, but. <laughs> Hey, look, so I, I'm going to start talking about my wife, and I can assure you, it's very possible. She'll wait to hear what I'm saying. If she can hear me, she'll look, pop in. She's like, well, this is the, this is the real deal right here. But, um, but, I, but, I, but I'll be honest with you, man. I, I tell people all the time, like, you know, number one thing, if you don't have the right partner, nothing's going to work out. Right, it doesn't matter what you're going through. If you don't have the right partner, nothing's gonna work out. Um, you know, we've been we've been extremely fortunate and blessed to not have to go through like outrageously difficult and, and trying times. But we've gone through bumps on the road, and we've done it as a team. Right, everything is a conversation, a consideration. We talk through and we walk through things together to ensure that we're making the right move for the family, like for us, right? I mean, and we know that each one of us has certain needs and we know Landon, the baby boy, he has needs. We, everything is, is walked through. And, you know, the best thing we could have done is gone on calendars, like together. So we book everything because my wife, she's a, she's a full-time, yeah, she's a full-time real estate agent. You know, okay. So check her out if you need to, to buy or sell a home, you know, at Q, the realtor. And, you know, I mean, she's out there driving, working. So we have to make sure that we have time scheduled to where hey, we can both work and do our thing. But, you know, we're getting land in the school. Well, when there's not a pandemic going on, get land in the school and, and, and pick them up, get them to where he needs to go, spend time as a family, you know, travel together. Um, but, you know, my wife and I, we've been together 11 years, mm-hmm. you know, married seven in, in October. And the, the same amount of, of love, passion, respect, friendship, you know, joy, happiness is all there because I, I have the perfect partner for me. And I'm fortunate in that, um, you know, some, some people may take a, a few marriages and have four kids, right? You know, I was, I was fortunate to, to get it right at the first time, there you, go, you know, and, and, and the only time, but, um, but yeah, I mean, that's one thing. And so it's, it's absolutely a team approach to everything we're doing, you know, and that's, you know, that's how I'm able to continue moving forward um, because, you know, she has my back, I have hers. And I tell you what, man, the day that, I got laid off in 2017. It was like, hey, sweetheart, you know, I don't want to go back to corporate realm. I want to take this thing and go 100 miles an hour, put all the blood, sweat, and tears in there. And she's like, okay, cool. As long as you pay that mortgage, you go do whatever you want. I'm like, all right, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you figure it out. As long as this mortgage is paid, <laughs> we can work together. That, that's yeah, awesome. yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's a scary thing, you know, especially to, to lose your job, but also know that burning desire in your heart and yeah. your spirit, like, man, I really want to do something else. Um, it's yeah. really tugging at my heart. Sometimes, you know, I guess things happen that way. You know, life happens where, you know, it, sometimes it forces you into those opportunities. You know, it forces you or at the same time you decide, well, you know what? You know, I'm just going to continue to put that on the back burner, whatever that burning yeah. desire is. And it's end up being instead of a dream for you, it's a daily nightmare because you're constantly reminded of the thing that you really want to do. And so it's always usually, you know, it, it takes the right to your point, the right partnership and the right communication yeah. style to so talk about, you know, what opportunities yeah. that you can make that transition together. Um, yeah, and, I, and I'll be honest, man. So, so, you know, you mentioned one thing that sticks with me because of just how things played out. You know, you mentioned having a, a dream desire turn into a nightmare if you're not able to make the move. I'll be honest with you, man. If I had not gotten laid off, I would probably still be at, you know, some organization saying to myself, okay, when I get to this point, I'm going to jump. When I get to this point, I'm going to jump, right? Because you, you, you never know what awaits you, right? And, I mean, it takes a ton of confidence, faith, you know, you name it to make that leap, and honestly, man, I don't know if I would have been strong enough to do it. You know, I, I fortunately got laid off because in yeah. my mind, like, now I need to be here because I want to make sure that I have a stable scenario, whether it be financially, emotionally, you know, support wise for my family. So I can't just jump out here. Um, sure. But when it did, and there, there was still some days afterwards, I was like, oh man, like this is this is all for me, right? If I don't yeah. if I don't do well today, this week, this month, like. You know, will, will we be eating? Will the lights stay on? Like, you have, you have thoughts like that, and it is outrageously scary. Um, but uh, you, you don't turn back? No, you brush your ass, you move forward 100 miles an hour, and you get it done. Keep going. Keep pushing. 
Um, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, what's, what's awesome is that you really have a sound perspective and you having that network of, you know, family individuals around you to help support that dream and craft that you've been working upon. Mm -hmm. if, if you could kind of look back and you're talking to younger Omar, like what are some of the things that you would advise yourself to say, hey, man, now that you've, you've gone through this process, you've been in the business for, you know, several years now, and you're going, you know, um, doing fairly well for yourself, what are some things that you would say to, to younger Omar, like, hey, man, this is something to think about, or, you know, what would you say to that person? Uh, how much time do we have? Because I got to tell my younger self, self to do or not do a whole lot of things. But, uh, <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> but no, so I mean, when it comes to kind of this element, I, I would tell myself, you know, still maintain the, the course in which I took. Um, and the reason why is because, you know, every step I take is also the understanding of if there's a misstep, will I still be okay, right? So ensuring that financially, you know, we'll be okay if something were to happen in a certain, certain amount of time, um, you know, having not only backup plans, but making just the, the best choice. And by that, I mean, how, you know, there's a point in time like, okay, you know, I'm going to go ahead and get a huge loan and maybe I'll get uh, a storefront or maybe I'll go do this, right? Because one thing that I would tell my younger self is to invest more at an earlier age than, than what I started right, whether it's business or personally, um, you know, to do some things, you know, bigger, faster, smarter. But at the same time, I was still, I'm happy that the approach I took in like a step-by-step, -step, you know, vet out the business, make sure the clientele is there, build, you know, vet this out, make sure your revenue is coming in, build. And by taking a, a very strategic and methodical approach to how I tested the waters in, in every aspect, in every avenue of the brand and building up, I was able to safeguard myself from like any, you know, huge, uh, you know, downfall or any huge missteps that would impact the business so much that there was no recovery. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, aside from, Tell my, my younger self, invest, you know, earlier, more, more frequent, right? Um, you know, the, the path I took worked, but at the same time, you don't know what could happen. So maybe go bigger, faster that would be another piece of advice. But again, you, you never know. I think, I think that's great and sound advice because when we're young, you can recover quicker, usually when you're really yeah. young. So you, you have that grace, you know, in theory of life to you know to fall and get back up and fall and get back yeah. up you know before those these major decisions in your life maybe it's marriage maybe it's a child mm -hmm. maybe it's a career path so you know i really appreciate you saying that so what would you you know suggest to anyone that's out there who's thinking about getting into the industry what are yeah. a couple of things that you would suggest um one that they you know think about but also mm -hmm. what are some things that um, you know, some pitfalls that they need to be aware of as well. Mm -hmm. So above all, anytime I talk to somebody that is interested in the business or starting out, learn, learn, learn as much as possible, right? And I talk to, you know, cats that have been in the business for decades. I'm like, hey, we're still learning. And that's a beautiful thing because that means that you are serious about continually, you know, to build up your knowledge and your craft to make it better for your client which is awesome. And that's how it should be for anybody in any industry. Um, but there's just so much. And especially as it relates to a handcrafted piece, like anything custom, there's so many things that can go wrong. There's so much knowledge needed. So anybody that is interested, you got to dive in and learn as much as possible, as much as possible and never stop learning. And then as, as far as pitfalls, you know, take it one step at a time, understand your value, you know, don't devalue yourself by having a, a premium product and, and giving it away to too many people or, you know, reducing it. Now, granted, there's a, a whole another conversation we can have on, like, entry-level marketing and promotions yeah. and yeah. brand ambassadors, the whole nine, right, which, which comes along with it. Um, but, you know, you have folks that may do too much for too long and they're, they are unable to really get a foothold because now their, their brand or their offering isn't where it should be, right? Got it. Or... Um, you know, properly vetting out the right supplier so that you're not getting taken for a ride by somebody saying, hey, you give me 30 Gs to, uh, to be your fabric supplier, and uh, yeah, you'll, you'll be all right. Just go off of that. I I've heard stories where, you know, guys have gone that route, and they've gotten taken for a ride, you know, whether it was, you know, a tailor that said they're going to do stuff for them, a, a, 
a production facility, a material supplier, yeah, you name it, right? Yeah. I mean, you have you have folks that are trustworthy, and you have a whole lot of folks that aren't. <laughs> um, so right. it's like, you know, so when I have conversations with vetting out somebody new, um, we have a very straightforward conversation. If it doesn't make sense, then we're, we're not going to do it. You know, luckily, um, I have I've not you know, again have it have I've not had any missteps that like just severely hurt the business. Um, and so now, you know, you know what to look out for as, as well as just listening to the advice of, uh, again, some of the cats have been in the business for a while, but, um, I mean, just you got, you know, it's all about the knowledge and respecting the craft and then not just diving into it to say like, Hey, I just want to, I just want, I just want to look good. You know, I want to be a clother so I can wear a whole lot of suits and look awesome all the time. But then, you know, you're, you're making craft for people. And then what happens is now somebody may have a bad experience with your brand like, okay. I'm not doing custom anymore because this is what it's all about, you know? Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't want that for anybody's brand. Or I wouldn't want that for anybody's perception of the world of, of bespoke or custom made pieces. Great. You know, that's, that's really um, helpful because I think that, you know, there's so much to be said about, you know, really being thoughtful in your product and services, but also mm -hmm. be thoughtful in the things that you say you want to do. And I said, you know, you know, you want to do it, but, how truly vested are you in it? Is it the right time for you? Maybe maybe you want to do it and you do that research and then you get into it instead of just going, you know, nosedive in and you find out the water's two feet. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> or, or, or the ice is too thick. You know what I mean? We've seen the memes and videos of people, you know, jumping in the lake and it's so thick they think they're going to crack through the thick <laughs> water. <laughs> you know? Yeah, man, because there's, there's a whole... And there's a whole lot that people just don't see, right? You know, for any business, but especially in custom clothing, because you know it goes way beyond. You know, if if you're my client assigned, it goes way beyond us sitting down, you know, talking about the fabrics, capturing measurements, move forward. Then you have the entire production process and ensuring that it is a smooth, a consistent, and a high quality process to now have that finished product to where there's still some more steps. And you know, what if something happens? You know, do you have the right level of customer service? You know, to deal with whatever may happen, and things will happen, right? There's no way to get around it. No matter how closely you watch something, no matter how many times you go over something, it is a hands-on, literally process. So things can things can go wrong. Whether it's from me personally, like I've messed up, you know, yeah. my my people have messed up. It happens, you know. But how do you go about remedying the situation to where somebody says, "Hey, I understand that, and I appreciate what you're doing to, to remedy the scenario or whatever you've done. I'm still cool. We're we'll, we'll working with you and, and tell more folks about the brand." taking that ownership and then allowing the mm -hmm. customer or client to, to make their sound decision, but also appreciate that, you know, you have their best interest at heart. So now I'm going to switch it to a little fun. Uh, okay. So I know we got about 10 minutes uh, or so, a little under 10 minutes. So maybe we can go through these and I didn't. So for those who are out there, I never share these questions with people and I'm really curious to get your feedback. So forgive me if I stump you on a couple of these. So I call, <laughs> this, okay. I call this the creative last supper. The creative life nice. supper. All right. So okay. who's gonna be eating with you and you have this, you know, this deep conversation and spend that time together. So Oswald Botain or Tom Ford? Oswald. Come on. Ralph Lauren or, or Paul Smith? Paul Smith. No, no, Ralph Lauren. Kenneth Cole or Calvin Klein? Mm. Uh oh. Kind of cool. I don't know that much about it, so. Okay. All right. No worries. Yeah. Shoes. Yeah. <laughs> you know? you know, yeah, there's a lot of things I want to hear. Okay, go ahead. Um, D'Angelo or John Legend? John Legend. Yves Saint Laurent or Alexander McQueen? McQueen. Wu-Tang or Outkast? Oh, man. Dude. <laughs> I know that's a good one. Oh, oh man, man! Cause hey, I grew up listening to Wu from the up north, but yeah. again, I appreciate the love Outkast being that man. Uh, Wu Tang, yeah. All right. <laughs> tell, tell big boy hundred two thousand not to be mad at me, but uh, yeah, I gotta take Wu on. on, on that stacks, forgive him, stacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jagged Edge or Jodeci? Jodeci. Mary J. Blige or Sade? Mary J. The Queen. 
Prince or Michael? <laughs> Man. Like, I, I want to say Michael, but I feel so bad. It's like, it was just, you know, it was just like Prince Day, you know? The, the, but, uh, man. You know what, Michael? I was, I was rocking with Michael in, like, late 80s, man. I, I go with Michael. All right. Um, Mahershala Ali mm-hmm. or Sterling K. Brown? Man, I don't know. All right. uh, Sterling K. Brown. I'm not familiar with him, man. Yeah. Okay. He so might, he might get on Brown, about he, it. He's the brother on This Is Us, and he was the brother on. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then who's uh, so, so okay? So yeah, I know him. And Mahershala, he he's the one who was on um, on Moonlight. He's been on the the. The ah, okay. Detective, true detective. He's gonna yep. play Blade. Yeah. Um, when well, I know, not not know both of them now. Um, hmm. I st- oh, yeah, I'll go with Sterling. Yeah, I'll go with Sterling K. Brown. Yeah. So, so Spike Lee or John Singleton? <laughs> Spike. Let me get look at some Spike. <laughs> He's kind of good combo. Yeah. All right. Um, Miles Davis or Coltrane? Oh. Miles Davis. Last question. If you could spend 24 hours with anyone dead or alive that's a creative that you found influence in, 24, who would it be and why? And who would you just chop it up, break bread, and, like, really pick their brain if you could? Mm-hmm. And it would be uh, a creative, right? Yeah, you know, someone, someone in the space that you know it doesn't have to be the space that we're in. It could be art, yeah. it could be, you know, anybody that or whoever you 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 can make that determination what creative means to you. Mm-hmm. Could be a family, was, could, be, could be a granddaddy. You know, you never know. Man, I, I was going like way way back. I was thinking of like like Roman and Parisian. Uh, you know, like architects or, or Egyptian, yeah, like just somebody can get a knowledge that you would never ever have access to, like any other time, man. Um, Who would that be? Uh, Hesepsis. Hesepsis. Mm-hmm. So that she was a an Egyptian queen ruler that ruled like through crazy means like even even crazier means than you know nefertiti's like rise yeah. and, and the way she got yeah but um because you said if i didn't have to pick a creative in my space like that would be interesting because one i'm very intrigued about you know the ancient egyptian culture and like that and then with her rise to power and like having to overthrow you know her your father as the ruler of the time and come up a lot of people are familiar with it um, i think it would be very interesting so i'm i butchered the name but it's uh his, right. his sepsis yeah. So what we'll do is we'll add that to the to the notes under the under the channel, you know, under this um, interview we're having. So we got about yeah. sixty seconds. I want to okay. thank you so much, Omar, for your time, your brilliance, and I want to make sure that everyone knows where to find you. And then we'll make sure that you send us. I want your brother's info. We want wifey's info, so that oh, everyone yeah. knows how to get in touch with you guys if they need a phenomenal photography, uh, an amazing house in Atlanta, and obviously some amazing garments. Absolutely, brother. Well, hey, thank you first and foremost, man. I love what you're doing. I'm always good to, to sit down and, and chop it up with you. But um, anybody can find me either on all the social media streams. I'm at Bespokature. That's B-E-S-P-O-K-U-T-U-R-E dot com is the website as well. You know, you feel free to reach out, ask questions. My brother's information is V k3 underscore photography and my wife's information is q q u e the realtor t h e r e r e a l t o r um and then uh, both of them they happy to take care of you whether it's snap a good shot or sell your home and hey man i spoke with you is more than happy to craft all the custom pieces you ever need so uh, my brother i appreciate spending this time with you man if you want to see what I'm wearing on a day-to-day basis, check out my Instagram. There you'll find a ton of looks that maybe you can choose from or at least get some inspiration.
Hope you enjoyed today's video. And if you have any questions or suggestions, leave them in the comments below. We'll see you next time.